Seara bună, bine ați venit la Flux. Mă bucur să fiu aici. Mă bucur să îl am pe Michael lângă mine și să avem o seară împreună cu el. Am înțeles că pot să zic că Fluxul este o întâlnire pentru cei care înțeleg engleză. În seara asta o să fie British English, adică engleză, și o să... Vă rog să fiți cât se poate de atenți, mai ales în momentul în care începeți să scrieți întrebări. Pentru că vrem să abordăm subiectul ăsta al victimizării, cultura victimizării, care e din ce în ce mai prezentă în toate mediile occidentale și vine peste noi. Și în timp ce o să fie prezentarea lui Michael, o să puteți să puneți întrebările pe Slido. Așa că țineți telefoanele la îndemână ca să puteți să le scrieți. Câteva cuvinte despre Michael, m-am întotdeauna din cum să-l introduc cum să-l prezint um, și am folosit o frază când l-am prezentat aseară, pe care de mult mi-aș, îmi doream să pot să o folosesc, și anume, pe când eram student la Oxford. Uh, nu știu pentru câți dintre voi, uh, <laughs> mulțumesc Dora, am vorbit cu Dora să râdă ea când zic chestia asta, <laughs> în cazul în care altcineva nu pricepe uh, aluzia. L-am cunoscut pe Michael în urmă cu 20 de ani, uh, nu mai repet, și l-am cunoscut ca prieten, ca profesor, după aceea ca și coleg. Și m-am bucurat să-l văd în enorm de multe ipostaze, vorbind de niște subiecte foarte grele, însă cu o pasiune pentru omul cu care vorbește incredibilă. Și în seara asta aș vrea să ne folosim de fiecare element pe care l-auzim ca să construim întrebările care se ne duc la niște întrebări profunde, răspunsuri profunde. Michael a locuit în Oxford, are trei copii, locuiește în Atlanta, căsătorit cu Anne, Anne este aici și ea cu noi, și v-aș spune să-l aplaudăm înainte să vorbească, dar nu încă. I-am spus să stea aici în spate, fiindcă dacă stătea acolo erau foarte lungi rundele de aplauze. Așa că l-am chemat aici să fie mai scurte. Michael, I just told what you said. Well, I'm very happy to be with you this evening, and um, we actually have quite a serious subject matter before us, and because and it has huge, huge ramifications, uh, possibly global. And about 2014, I began thinking about what I'm going to be sharing with you, and the reason I began thinking about it was when I was in Europe. Um, when I was in the Middle East, when I was in Asia, when I was in Africa, everybody was asking me to speak to the same question. And that's unusual. It's unusual in so many cultures, in so many countries, for people to have the same question. And it was this question about bitterness, anger, why is there so much contention in the world right now? And if anything, it's got worse since then. So it's a very serious subject matter. So I'm nervous about my capacity to keep you awake uh, so late um, during, the, during the week, when you probably have more interesting TV programs to watch. It uh, reminded me of a, an old story of a pastor who was very famous for preaching very long, very serious sermons. And he'd been in the same church for 20 years, and eventually a group came to him and said, you know, would you like to leave the church and we will give you a teaching post somewhere? And so it was his last... Uh, Sunday in the church and he would preach his last sermon. He made it much longer than normal, much more detailed than normal, much heavier than normal. And they, after he'd finished speaking, a few people came to give a word of thanks. We want to thank the pastor for his final message. And finally, the worship leader came to the front and he said, you know, Jesus brought our pastor to us. Now Jesus is taking him away. Why don't we all sing a song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? <laughs> And so I'm hoping and praying you will not be feeling that way by the time we finish uh, this, uh, this particular session together. The subject matter we'll be dealing with has very, very deep pastoral consequences, very, very deep intellectual consequences. It's because we'll be looking at issues of hurt and pain, which at times can feel overwhelming, as well as intellectual ways of how we look at the world, how we interpret the world, how it drives us, that 
in one sense, it would be impossible to give a complete overview. So I'm going to give you a part of an analysis, not, not all of it, um, to try to focus on, on just a few of the things. And then in the Q&A, I will do the very best I can to answer the questions. And um, if I can't answer the questions, then Vlad will come up and he will tell you what the answer is. <laughs> but the, the kinds of solutions, therefore, are also very complex. So whether you're in the secular world, whether you're in the political world, whether you're in the Christian world, whether you're in the religious world, any solution to what I'm about to talk about, I know will be controversial and there will be disagreement about it. And so I will try to share things as best as I see it while at the same time acknowledging that you could find equally uh, strong uh, voices arguing and presenting the same kind of material in a very different way. Now that is the problem when you deal with any issue that affects society at large. Um, the writer G.K. Uh, Chesterton, um, um, he once gave a very interesting analogy and the first time I was ever asked to speak to a group of people in the European Parliament, about 250, 300 Euro MPs and various ambassadors to the EU, I was trying to think of a, an illustration that would encompass what I wanted to talk to them about. And G.K. Chesterton, the, the writer, thinker, author, he said, we often make what he called the medical mistake. And he said, the reason I use this term is he says, when you listen to politicians, they like to use medical terminology. So politicians will say something like, our country is sick, our nation is sick, the world is sick, and here is a solution to this problem. But he said, medical science and political science are very different. He said, in medical science, when you go to the hospital, all of the doctors agree, what does a healthy body look like? What the doctors may disagree is, why are you ill? So one doctor may think you have an allergy, another doctor may think you have this disease, another doctor thinks, no, you have a virus. So, but the thing is, all of the doctors agree, this is what a healthy body looks like. So the doctors, by necessity, may send you home with one leg less in order to save your life. The doctors will never send you home with one leg extra. Okay? So they all agree this is what a healthy body looks like. They may disagree what, does, what is the cause. He says in political science, it's the other. In political science, all political scientists seem happy to say something's wrong. What they disagree about is what does a healthy person look like? What does a healthy society look like? And what one party proposes as, as the solution to another party is worse than the problem it seeks to solve. And so he says, because we can't agree on the good, this is why we tear our eyes out. And so I want to be very careful while I'm speaking to you because I have this warning of his in my mind. And to some extent, we're talking about why is it that there seems to be a lot of... A lot of um, challenge in global culture at the moment. Back in, in 2014, 2015, when I first began thinking about this, I, my thoughts were very much stimulated by the prophet Hosea and the prophet Amos. And both of them made a comment several thousand years ago, which went like this. They said to the people, you have turned justice into bitterness. So all your righteousness tastes like poison fruit. You have turned justice into bitterness, so your righteousness tastes like poison fruit. What they're saying is this, if the quest for justice becomes bitter and angry, even if you get what is right, it's gonna taste like poison in everybody else's mouth. Now that also means the opposite of true. If the quest for justice is love and compassion, when you get what is right and you fulfill justice, what you're left with is left love and compassion. When the quest for justice is bitter, when you get justice, you're just left with the bitterness. And the way love and compassion work in a society, the way bitterness works in a society are two different things. So what we're talking about this evening is about the fact that we live in a world 
where we are constantly crying out for justice in almost every country of the world right now, but most of those cries for justice are bitter. Most of them are angry. What is going on? How do we understand it? Now, as far as I can see, there are seven main reasons why there's so much global anger and bitterness right now. I won't bore you with those. But what I would like to pick up on and just start this conversation with you is with some writings by a, a group of people called Lukianov and Hate. Um, and his name is spelled H-A-I-D-T, not H-A-T, which is confusing when you're talking about hate. But it's a, it's a two, you know, he doesn't, his surname is different to the way it sounds. But what they pick up on is something that's been well known in many social sciences for a long time. And it's critiqued, it's not perfect, but generally speaking, when you look at societies, classically, we would distinguish an honor society from a dignity society. So in an honor-based society, what we look for in our leaders, what we admire, are people who act with honor. So you defend your honor. The people who we look up to, the people who we want to lead us, are people who conduct themselves in that way. It's what we dream of our leaders looking like. And the, your, your engagement is always very public in an honor culture. If someone insults your honor, you will then publicly defend your honor because that's the important thing that you need. And honor gives you status in society. It gives you a voice, which is why you can lead. Now, in a dignity-based society, it's quite different. In a dignity-based society, you don't say, I earn your respect by acting honorably. You rather assume, look, you should respect me because of who I am. Because of my role as a human being and the way I conduct myself just privately means that I have dignity. And in a dignity-based culture, if you are attacked, you may not publicly defend yourself. You may say nothing publicly because it's undignified. Rather, you may take the in, approach the individual privately who has the issue and sit down with them and talk with them and try and resolve it. And you may then leave that room and say nothing about the conversation apart from we were able to resolve this. And that would be a dignified response. And we look for dignity in our leaders. Now, some cultures combine a few of these things together, both honor and dignity. But generally speaking, we were trying to, various academics were trying to analyze most culture through that lens. Roughly a decade ago, although the thought goes back much more further than that, we began to talk more about the kind of grievance culture. So rather than an honor culture or a dignity culture, we began to think about cultures being driven by, by how much pain you had been through. So what an honor culture and a dignity culture have in common is that in an, in an honor culture, in a dignity culture, if someone comes after you or criticizes you or hurts you, you need to respond. Does that make sense? Hey, they spoke to me, I need to respond. If I have a very powerful father, I don't go to him and say, Daddy, I want you to go and beat up these people. They were mean to me. That's not honorable. That's not dignified. And literature is filled with stories of the spoilt prince you know, who did not command the respect of his people because he didn't act with honor or didn't act with dignity. But those two different cultures both require, hey, you have to take responsibility. Even if you're the person who's been hurt, you have to deal with it. And secondly, in both honor cultures and dignity cultures, you do not boast about your suffering. You do not boast about your pain. You're, you're careful where you share it, and very often only in private. But in a grievance culture, things change very differently. In a grievance culture, the person who suffered the most has the highest level of status. They have the biggest voice. And so you get what some people call competitive victimhood. In other words, you tell me a story about how bad your life is, and I say, you think your life is bad? Well, I suffered this. And then they say, well, that may have happened to you, but you also need to know this about my life. And then I say, well, look, that's true. You had bad parents, but my parents were really terrible. And this is what they did to me. And my grandparents were even worse. 
And then you say to me, but Michael, you live in the West. You should see the country where I live, where this, and we're now locked into who has the most amount of suffering? Who has the most amount of pain? Who has the greatest grievance? Whoever wins that battle has the biggest response, has the largest voice, and everything should reflect through you. So all of a sudden, we're in competition with each other. So whereas in honor cultures and dignity cultures, we loved stories of people who overcame their pain, who overcame their suffering, in grievance cultures, the, you can't let go of your pain because your pain gives you status. Let me try to explain wh what I mean. I don't know how many of you watch Marvel superhero movies. Do any of you watch those? Don't be ashamed. Is it most of you? Yeah. You're wasting your time watching that rubbish. Uh, as I was in Bucharest, I explained to them there, I explained to you, I have to watch movies because I think about culture, but you shouldn't be wasting your time. So, but just think about superheroes for a moment. When I was a boy, the biggest superhero was Superman. I don't know if you've seen the 1980s Superman movie, movies. Now Superman, why was he Superman? Well, he was physically perfect, intellectually perfect, morally perfect. Handsome, strong, every time I think of him, he reminds me of me. The only difference is he's a superhero. He can fly and he's bulletproof. That's why he's a superhero. What was, Mo what was Superman's weakness? So some people know, kryptonite. That was his only weakness. You wanted to kill him, you expose him to kryptonite. Have any of you seen Man of Steel, the millennial remake of Superman? That movie starts very differently. When Superman was remade, the movie starts with Superman in a boat, lost in the fog. He feels cosmically alienated, socially alienated, misunderstood, misrepresented, unable to reveal his true identity, wrestling with his, his, his calling and suffering. Superman now has a victim narrative. Every Marvel superhero Every single one has been used, abused, betrayed, hurt. They are heroes, not because they've been able to overcome their pain, but because they're defined through their pain. And the more suffering they have had, the more status they have. Which means that if you watched Captain America, which in my opinion may be the most boring superhero ever invented, in order for him to have a sequel, a second movie, what must happen? How does the second movie start? Betrayed by his country, betrayed by his friends, abandoned by those who's, who he loves, misunderstood, hurt, abandoned, attacked from every side. He needs to have a narrative of pain in order to be a hero. A professor by the name of Vulcan from the University of Virginia started writing about this very insightfully in the 1970s. Not about superheroes, that's me. He was much more insightful. And what Professor Vulcan said was, we all have chosen trauma. Now, let me try to explain what I mean by that. I realize that some of this is technical. Chosen trauma does not mean to him, you choose to have bad things happen to you. That's not what he means. What he means by the term chosen trauma is everyone will experience traumatic events in their life. Everyone will experience pain. Everyone will experience betrayal. We will all experience that. Sometimes nations experience that. The question is, what trauma do we allow to choose to define us? That was his question. So chosen trauma for him was what things have happened in our past or in our nation's past that now define who we are. He gives an incredible example, and I won't tell the whole story, of a guy called Prince Lazar. But Prince Lazar was in the late 1200s, the Prince of Kosovo. He was killed in a battle. And I'm not going to go into the historical argument as was he shot in the front, was he shot in the back, what happened. But this is sufficient to say he died. When he died, the people of Kosovo were so 
not just upset, but so worried that his body would be captured by their enemies, they buried him a long way away so that even if their city fell, the body of their prince would not fall in with an enemy land. For hundreds of years afterwards, people sang songs about him, there were nursery rhymes about him, you learnt about him in school. It was a defining moment for the people. When the Austro-Hungarian Empire realigned itself on the, uh, after 450 years after he died, they appealed to the emperor to return Prince Lazar's body to them. And they, the emperor refused and said, no, we'll keep the body here. Well, on the 500th anniversary of their death, they once again appealed to the emperor, please return his body, we want him buried here. When that request was refused, a young man set off to avenge himself for this historical injustice. After 500 years of still not getting justice, he now wanted to take action. And this young man set off and assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife in 1914 and started the First World War. Traumatic events can cast very long shadows. And it allows the past to dictate the future. And all of us, to some extent, in our nation, in our history, in our personal life, are always in danger of allowing these past traumas to define who we are, to define our value. And in a world where we talk about grievance all the time and how much we've been hurt, we begin to compete. I mean, my mother is from a small country called Cyprus. Some of you will know of it. Some of you will know that it's been, has had a difficult past for about three and a half thousand years, conquered by the Hittites, conquered by almost every single empire. The Caesar, Michael Antony, gave the country as a love gift to Cleopatra. So imagine that, you know, giving a whole country and its population you know, to your lover, you know, as a gift. Happy Valentine's Day. All the way through up through the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire, 1964, they get their, their independence. Things do not go well with how they treat the Turkish Cypriot minority. The Turks invade in 1974. If you have any friends from Cyprus, you will know. We are experts at complaining. We are masters at it. And we have a three and a half thousand year history of invasion, conquer, and everything else to justify the anger and how we feel. But the trouble is, it prevents you from moving forward. We live in a world where we are increasingly defined by our pain, where we are increasingly defined by our grievance culture. And here's the difference. When we allow this to happen, Unlike in honor cultures and dignity cultures, thinking, what must I do to solve it? We feel that the solution must come from someone else. It's someone else's responsibility. So in grievance cultures, we constantly cry out for third parties to come in from outside to right the wrongs that we're powerless to do. And that's what happens when we fall into that trap of thinking that way. We make ourselves powerless. Which is why when we fall into this mentality, the way people galvanize into, into us into action is by making us angry. So in a global grievance culture, the way the dynamic works is you, everybody's in their own little group. The, this is this group A, here's our complaint. Here's group B, this is their complaint. Here's group C, this is their complaint. No one is allowed to speak about your complaint apart from you. They don't have the right to talk about it because they're from the outside. If they want to come and join my group, they must advocate my pain more vociferously, more militantly than me. And if they do this in an unqualified way, I will welcome them into my group. But as soon as they criticize me and say, but Michael, should you really feel that way? Then I'll throw them out. Which means if you're running for political office, you calculate the number of grievance groups in your society you calculate how many people are in each group and you vociferously and militantly advocate their complaint 
And if you get the maths right, you win the election every single time. Which means we tend to get leaders who create a vortex of grievance, continually escalating the complaint and making everything worse and worse and harder and harder. Well, this is a huge issue. When we're in pain, we feel justified on inflicting pain on other people. You may have noticed that. When you feel that everything's wronged you, all you normally want to do is destroy the other person. How do you break that cycle? Well, what I'd like to do, if I can, is switch gear and share one of the stories that Jesus told. I'm picking it because I was in a country I will leave unnamed, and I was speaking to a group of terrorist leaders, and we were talking about, is it possible to overcome these historical divisions? What do you do when you have two groups of people who hate each other and want to destroy each other? What on earth do you do? And when they asked me this question, I said, it's very interesting you asked me this question. Jesus told a story in which he answers that question for us. And the leader of this particular group said, I would like to hear the story he told. And as a matter of fact, you know the story. I'll be amazed if you're here and you don't know the story. Even if you've only been to church two times in your life, the chances are you've heard this story. The setting for the story is a lawyer comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, even in secular cultures, we ask the question, what is good? What is the right thing to do? Even if we don't believe in an afterlife, we would like to continue to live in other people's memories and for them to think of us positively. So most of us are trying to think, I want to be a good person, I want to do the right thing. Now most of the world is actually religious by conviction. Christian 2.4 billion, Muslim the next largest group, and then so on. And so they ask the question, well if, there, if God is there, how do I make him happy? So someone comes to Jesus and says, look, you're obviously a very good person, and God must like you and you'll be going to heaven, and I would like you to help me, what must I do to be a good person? And Jesus gives a very famous answer. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now here's the problem. If the lawyer was thinking, he would say, this is impossible. Do you know how difficult it is to love your neighbors? My guess is that even if you're, you go to church, that you can think right now of someone in your church you you find it difficult to love. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to share names, but there are pastors here. Maybe they would like to hear the names afterwards. I'm not going to answer for you. But most of us can immediately, you must love all of your neighbors, can immediately think of someone who is hard to love. A neighbor that we have that we, we don't particularly like. And life would be much easier if they just disappeared. I mean, maybe it's just me and no one in Romania has this problem. I, have a, I had a friend who was once speaking to business executives and he asked them to imagine peace. What does peace look like? And he gave them five minutes to answer that question. Just to sit and imagine peace. After five minutes, they shared the pictures. One shared a picture of a snow-capped mountain with no footprints in the snow, just this beautiful picture of just white, still snow. Another shared a picture of a field filled with flowers. Another shared a picture of a lake, you know, reflecting the sky and the clouds above it, just perfectly calm. All of the pictures were different. All of the pictures had one thing in common. There were no people in them. Now, isn't that interesting? We ask someone to imagine what does peace look like. The first thing we do is eliminate everybody else. So when Jesus gives this answer, the most natural response would be, well, okay, loving God, he's a nice guy, okay. Loving my neighbor, perfectly. 
just as much as I love myself. Loving, every, loving my family, that, that's slightly harder. How is it possible? So the good question would have been, how is it possible to do this? It isn't possible to love in this kind of way, Jesus, especially if you've been hurt or betrayed. What about people who do these things or those things? What about them? But the guy says, okay, great, I can do this. I can love perfectly. And then he asks the question, who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus is not going to answer this question and you'll see, you'll see why in a minute. Because the question then is, okay, if I have to love these people perfectly, who are my neighbors? In other words, if I have to love my neighbors, I love myself, how big a group is it? Is it like my family, my extended family? I mean, we're in Romania. Extended family is also challenging. When my, I got engaged with my wife uh, from England, she came to Cyprus and my mother, who is Cypriot, said, you're not engaged until we have the fam a family party. And my wife said, well, who's coming? And my mother said, just the close family. So Anne is thinking five, ten people. Okay? Forty people come because it's just the close family. Okay? You talk about family, it's much bigger than that. So the guy's saying, look, how big is this group of neighbors? And then Jesus tells this incredibly well-known story. It's actually, possibly, one of the most morally challenging stories he tells. And I'll try to explain to you why. Jesus said, okay, there was a man walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now that road runs through a desert. There is no water on that road. There were no villages or settlements on that road for about, well, actually well over a thousand years after Jesus came because without water, you can't make a town. It was only actually almost one and a half thousand years later under the occupation of the crusading army that they had a big enough military machine to bring water to forts and they put forts down the road to fortify it because it was a very unsafe road. You have a long road running through the desert, no people, no, you know, I mean, no settlements, no one to call on for help. So you're very vulnerable. And Jesus said, there was this guy walking down the road and he sees a half, well, a body lying by the side of the road and he walks on by. And he was a priest. And then Jesus said, then a Levite came. He saw this half dead, half naked body lying by the side of the road. He also walks on by. Now, here's the challenge. Jesus is answering the question, who is my neighbor? That was the question he was asked. That's why he's telling this story. Now, the trouble is there's a half dead body. Well, how do you tell where someone is from? Well, in the Middle East to this day, if you know how to interpret the dress, you know what country that people are from. I lived in the Middle East most of my childhood. By looking at their clothes, you can tell. They're Saudi, they're Jordanian, they're, you could, just by looking at their clothes. From the way they fold the headdress, you can tell. Are they married or single? Just by the way they fold the single men one way, married men another way, just by looking at them. So you can tell their ethnicity, you can tell their marital status. If they speak, then they'll have an accent. The accent tells you what part of that country they're from. So in Romania, there must be accents. You can tell there's someone from the south or from the north. We also tend to have educated accents and accents we think of as being less educated. So in Jesus' time, the accent from Nazareth, for example, was considered to be for the more simple, stupid people. If you were educated, you spoke with a different accent, which is why they said, can anything good come from Nazareth? But this man, there are three problems. Number one, he has no clothes. Number two, he is unconscious, so he cannot speak. So you have no way of knowing where he's from. And number three, he must be lying face down on the road because he has no clothes. And there is a way, if you're Jewish, to tell if a man is Jewish if he is naked. And if you don't know how to do this, then there are two pastors at the front. They will explain how you can recognize a naked Jewish man. 
but he must also be lying down. So they can't see his face or anything. Now, I said this is one of the most morally challenging stories Jesus tells. Let me try and put it in context for you. So I was just in Bucharest, it's the capital city, right? I don't know if it's like this in Cluj, Cluj is smaller, but maybe it's true for Cluj too. But my guess is that certainly in Bucharest, there are parts of town you would not want to be at 1 a.m. in the morning on your own. Are there parts of Cluj like that too? You would tell your children, never go there 1 a.m.? No, but probably Bucharest more likely, right? So I imagine the following scenario. Imagine a friend calls you at one o'clock in the morning and they say, they wake you up, you answer the phone, they say, I'm in Bucharest, I'm in this part of town. And you say, are you safe? And he say, yes, I'm okay. But on the other side of the road, I can see an unconscious body lying there, not moving. Do you, should I go and help them? What would you say to your friend? One honest man in the room and the rest of you are thinking, I think I know the answer, but I don't want to share it. You would say no. You would say, keep walking, find someone else, when it's safe, call the police, send them. Don't stop, you're in the, this, you should not be there. This is dangerous, you could die. So when Jesus told the story and the priest is on his own, all by himself, and then here is his half dead body by the side of the road and Jesus said, he walked like this, no one would have thought he did anything wrong because to stop is to risk your life. Maybe it's a trap. Maybe the guy's pretending to be dead. Then he will attack him and steal him. There's no one else to help him. Let me tell you a different story. Supposing your friend rings you 1 a.m. Hey, I'm in this part of Bucharest. I, I can see this naked, unconscious body lying by the side of the road. Shall I stop? You say no. You say to them, I think it's your brother. Now, how does your answer change? Would you now say to them, can you check? No, be, be very careful, like, keep your eyes open. But can you get close to confirm? Is that what you would say? Would you say, I'm calling the police now, I'm gonna send help, stay nearby, you know, stay on the phone, we'll get help there. Isn't that what you would say? If it is your brother, if it is your sister, you will do everything you can to help them, including risking your own life. So the way Jesus tells this story is incredibly powerful. They're walking and they've got no idea, no way of telling who it is. Are they Jewish or not? They can't tell. Are they my neighbor? Are they connected to me? I cannot tell. But it's just too risky to stop so I go by on the other side because the two communities hate each other. I mean, <laughs> even in the church today, we're aware 2,000 years ago, the Samaritans and the Jews, they didn't talk to each other. They didn't trust each other. There was real hatred between them. So now a Samaritan man comes. Jesus is talking to Jewish people. He picks their enemy. If it's not too close to the bone, this would be like me telling a story of a beaten, half-naked Romanian lying by the side of a road and two people pass by on the other side and then a Russian military person comes along and he's the one who decides to help. But the story gets even more challenging. The Samaritan man, Jesus said, makes himself very vulnerable by crouching down to treat him and he puts his life on the line. And then he puts the man on his own donkey and takes him to a village. However, there are no Samaritan villages on that road. They are all Jewish. They're about five to 10 kilometers off the road because the road itself is empty. So he now goes to a Jewish town. So imagine I'm telling you this story and I say, well, look, this Russian guy finds a half-dead Ukrainian 
and takes him into a Ukrainian town, walks into the bar, and says to the man selling drinks, this guy is one of yours, he's wounded. Here is money for you to look after him, and then turns to leave. Now, notice how Jesus tells the story. He says, um, please take care of him. He takes out some money, gives it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he says, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expenses you have. And then the story ends. So the story ends with the guy in the inn, handing over money to someone who hates him. And then he turns to leave, and the story ends. So imagine you're watching a film. The film ends with your sworn enemy in one of your towns, talking to one of your innkeepers, and what, do you, what should happen to the enemy? What are you expecting to happen to him? Well, you're expecting him to get killed. And after he hands over the money, the movie ends. Well, what do you want to know? What's the question? Does the guy leave alive? I mean, this is one of my complaints with modern movies. They never end, especially Marvel movies. You get to the end, and then you realize it's not the end. They want a sequel. Well, that's exactly what's like what Jesus is doing here. He tells the story. It doesn't end. What is the ending? What happens to the Samaritan who helps this guy, puts his life at risk, then walks in to a town that hates him, turns to leave, and then it goes, the story ends. Does he get out? Do they beat him? Do they imprison him? Do they hang him? Is he able to escape? I mean, what happens? We don't know. The story that Jesus told isn't saying the price the Samaritan paid is the two gold coins he handed over. That's what we think it cost the Good Samaritan. That's not what it cost the Good Samaritan. What it cost the Good Samaritan is he was willing to risk his life. He was willing to lay down his life for someone who turned actually not to be one of his people, not to be one of his family. And not only that, to be someone who was his sworn enemy. And then Jesus asks a very interesting question. Who acted in a neighborly way? Not who is my neighbor, but who acted in a way to make that person their neighbor? Well, that's a very challenging question, isn't it? It's a really challenging question. How do you break grievance culture? How do you break this mentally imprisoned way of thinking? It costs a lot. The Samaritan was willing to pay the greatest price to help someone else. The message of the Christian gospel is not when it was convenient, Jesus came and forgave us. The message of the Christian gospel is when we were his enemies, when we hated him, when we wanted nothing to do with him, when we despised and rejected him, he came for us. He laid down his life for us. He offered us forgiveness and a blessing before we even knew we needed it. And he rescued us when we were powerless to do anything about it. And he paid the price for us. The reason what Jesus is saying here, the reason it is so challenging, is he saying you wanna change the world? You want to overcome this cycle of hate? You want to see this kind of thinking broken? Well, you're gonna to have to find a way where you don't retaliate to what's done to you. When the opportunity comes, you help those. All grievance culture requires what's called dichotomous thinking. Them, us, them, us. Does that make sense? Us, them. We are, this is one of us. That is one of them. When I was speaking in Bucharest, we were speaking about love. Now, of course, I'm sure it's not true in Romania, and it may be shocking for you to hear, but in some parts of the world, 
Christian churches do not love each other. I mean, this must be very hard to imagine that we would have us, them thinking. But actually, Jesus is saying, you need to redefine us. And it's not just who is like you, and it's not just who thinks like you. A few years ago, I was speaking with another leader of a very violent organization, and he asked me the question, if someone believes the wrong thing, does their life have any value? And that's a really interesting question. Coming from a terrorist. If someone believes the wrong thing, does their life have any value? Here's what worries me right now. In many parts of the world, we answer that question by saying no. That's the answer he gave. And in many parts of the Western world, we would say no. You meet someone who, is, who believes the wrong thing, cancel them, take away their platform. You meet someone who's caused you pain, cancel them, take away their platform. If someone believes the wrong thing, is doing the wrong thing, then actually, no, you don't treat their life as it has value. What Jesus is talking about here is reaching out even to our enemies in such a way as to try and see them won over. It is not always possible. Jesus never says, this will always work. Why is the story unfinished? Because it's possible that in one sense the Samaritan failed. Maybe the town he went to attacked him. Maybe he never left, but he tried. Maybe he did leave, and what he did was so powerful it changed the way that part thought about another group who they thought was been against them. We don't know, but it puts before us a vision as to how this can be turned around and completely reversed. Sometimes when I uh, speak about this, and this will be my final illustration, and I say this to give you a false sense of hope, um, is in the book, the book of Jonah is read every year out loud in Jerusalem. I don't know if you know that. Every year, they take the book of Jonah and they read it out loud in its entirety. Now, of all of the books of the Old Testament, why would you pick the story of Jonah and read it out loud to the whole nation every year? And the reason is actually quite profound. In the book of Jonah, God comes to Jonah and says, I want you to go to the great city of Nineveh and tell them they have to repent. Or there will come judgment. Jonah doesn't go to Nineveh. He goes the opposite direction, down to the sea, where there's a boat waiting for him, which illustrates the truth that if you're running away from God, the devil will always give you transport. So the boat is waiting for him, and he goes down into the boat. The boat goes out into the storm. You know the story. Jonah gets, goes down into the sea. A big fish comes and swallows him, which liberal theologians feel this is a very fishy story, if you know what that phrase means in English. He goes all the way to the bottom of the sea. He can't get any lower. He goes in the opposite direction. And the question is why? God comes to Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh. Nineveh has been conquered by the Assyrians. It's part of the Assyrian Empire. Many ancient historians would say the Assyrian Empire was one of the most evil empires that has ever existed in history. And Jonah hated them. They oppressed his people. They killed his people. They oppressed his family. God comes to Jonah and says, I want you to go and tell them they have to repent. So just think with me for a moment. Think of the person you like the least. I know you're not used to thinking about people you don't like in a setting like this, but think of the person you like the least. And God comes to you, personally, God comes to you and says, what he says, what he says to Jonah, he says to you, the stench has reached to heaven, this person's life is terrible, I want you to go and tell them to repent. You know, would, wouldn't you feel good about that? That God himself came and said, hey, you know that person you think is terrible? I agree. They're worse than you think they are. And I'm gonna send you and go with you so you can go and tell them. You, wouldn't you sort of feel, this is nice. But Jonah runs away. Why? Well, Jonah answers that question in chapter four. After Jonah has the very dramatic experience 
of being vomited onto the beach. He decides, okay, I'll go to Nineveh. It's preferable to be swallowed by a giant fish. And he shares the message and the people are forgiven, all of them. One of the greatest cities of the Assyrian Empire. Every man, every woman, everyone turns to God. And in Jonah chapter four, verse one, it says, and Jonah became angry. That word means so angry, he could be sick. That's how angry he is. And he said to God, this is why I ran away. That's why I was so quick to flee. I know, Jonah says, you are a gracious and a compassionate God, a God who relents from sending calamity. So Jonah says, look, that's why I ran away, God. I knew if I went and spoke to these people that you would forgive them. That's why I ran away. Jonah didn't want them to be forgiven. Jonah wanted them to be destroyed. That's what Jonah wanted. Jonah said, I know you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love. Then Jonah says, kill me. Take away my life. And then God asked Jonah a very interesting question. Because Jonah is defined by his grievances. Jonah is defined by his pain. And God says to him, Jonah, is it right for you to feel this way? And Jonah says, it is right. So Jonah is so angry that even when God comes to him and says, should you really feel this way? He says, yes. Now, if I was God, this is what I would do. I would say, Jonah, I personally appeared to you in chapter one. I gave you an incredible commission. I sent you to this city of Assyria and as a result of me working in you, you have seen a whole city, 100%, the biggest revival recorded in the Bible happened through your preaching, the message I gave you. You should feel happy about that. You're angry and I'm coming to you and I'm saying, is it really right for you to be this angry? And you're so angry, you're pointing your finger at me saying, yes, it is. If I was God, I would go like this. No more Jonah. But what does Jonah do? Well, God makes a plant grow up. Jonah sits under the plant. He's now in the shade. Then the plant dies. Jonah's angry again. And God says to Jonah, Jonah, you're angry about one plant dying. Do you not think I should have compassion on all of these people who can't tell their right hand from their left? And not just them, but all of their animals too. And the story ends. It's another unfinished story. The the question in the book of Jonah is not, will God forgive? The question in the book of Jonah is, will, will Jonah forgive? That's the question in the book of Jonah. Will Jonah hang on to his anger and his pain and even then become angry with God because God forgave? Or will Jonah say, actually God, you're right. You forgave them in the same way you've also forgiven me. And that's why that book is read every year out loud in Jerusalem. It's a challenge to the people. Will you be angry with God if he forgives your enemies? Or will you remain in your anger? When you remain in your anger, destruction will surely follow. You don't just destroy your enemies, you often end up destroying yourself. Can I pray? And then we'll have some questions. Father, we started this evening by saying that this is a very difficult and hard subject, and it is. Lord, we live in a world where we don't just see anger and pain and bitterness, we, we've experienced it. Lord, we thank you that you see our own hearts and minds. You know where we're hurt, you know where we're offended. Lord, you know where we feel bitterness. 
But Lord, we want to thank you that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Lord, we ask us, teach us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Lord, help us, Lord, to see what it means to extend grace and compassion to others. And Father, Lord, we pray that we might remember why you came, to bring peace on earth. And Father, we pray, will you bring peace in our hearts that we may carry that peace to others. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. If you need to take medicine. No, no. no. <laughs> if you have uh, medicine to, for a headache, now's the time to take it. Um, because we'll have some questions, I think. Maybe. Maybe. We have quite a few. Oh, we have quite um, a few questions. <clears throat> Are these questions that you made up? <laughs> some of them. <laughs> um. You know, I'm just realizing I should have apologized to Vlad for anything I've done to make him angry because he has power over the questions. And so that would have been the smart thing to do. And I also have power over your bedroom. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, avem câteva întrebări și așa cum știți, uh, voturile contează și v-aș ruga să aruncați și vă privire peste ele în așa fel încât în timpul pe care îl avem la dispoziție să răspundem cu prioritate la întrebările pe care voi le votați. Um, we have quite a few questions and I'd like to phrase the next questions in the, the question in the context in which we have elections next year. Next year. Quite mm. a few. So people will listen <coughs> to some stories coming from a specific perspective. Yes. So given the context, can, we use some, can you use something other than pain narrative in an emotion-driven culture? What will people listen more? Wow. That's a very good question. Hmm. Okay. Sadly, what history tells us is the easiest way to motivate people who have a grievance and are in pain is to make them angry. When, when you feel that you are a victim of everything happening to you, you feel very powerless. Does that make sense? You feel you can't do anything, you can't change anything, you give up. But if someone comes and makes you angry, now you're motivated, and motivated people will vote. So, making people angry is a really good way to get them out and vote, because they're now scared, they're frightened, and they're angry. There is another way, but it's actually much, it's much harder. It takes a toll on leaders, and it's harder for the people. The other question is, Are we able to cast a better vision, a stronger hope, a better story to overcome the problem of the world we're in? Have you ever used the Odysseus, Orpheus story? Yeah. There's a guy who wrote a book and it's making a very different point. But he, in the beginning of his book, he tells two Greek myths. One about a guy called Odysseus and one about a guy called Orpheus. Odysseus was a guy who went on a big voyage and he fought the Cyclops with one eye and you know, went to Troy in the Trojan horse. Do you know this story? Okay. Well, Odysseus also wants to hear the sirens sing. The sirens are mermaids and they have the most beautiful voices in the world. But they live on a small island surrounded by sharp rocks. So what the sirens do is they sing this song and it sounds beautiful. And the sailors sail close to the island to hear the song and their ship gets destroyed on the rocks and then the mermaids come and sort of eat the sailors. So it's not a very happy story. So, but this, the song is so powerful. Does that make sense? It makes the sailors come and they die every time. So Odysseus, he wants to hear the singing, but he doesn't want to die. So he asks the sailors to tie him to the mast of the boat okay, with very strong ropes so he cannot break free. And all of the sailors, they block up their ears so they cannot hear anything. And they sail close to the island so Odysseus can hear the singing, but not so close that they all die. And because the sailors have blocked their ears, they can't hear the song. But Odysseus goes almost insane. He's like straining against the ropes. He's yelling orders to the sailors, take me closer, but they can't hear him. 
And eventually, when they're a long way away, they untie the ropes and Odysseus is exhausted, but he's, at least he's alive, and he heard the siren song. But he almost went crazy. Now, there's another story about a guy called Orpheus. Orpheus wanted to see the sirens, and he sailed his boat close to the island. He produced a harp, and he sang a more beautiful song than the ones that the mermaids sang. And they swam out to him. We're in a huge need for leaders now who can sing a better song and tell a better story. We, so there is a way, but it requires vision and it requires patience. Moses would cast out a better vision to get people out of oppression and they were angry with their oppressors after 400 years, you'll understand why. But even Moses at one point said to God, God, take away my life, I cannot lead these people. And anyone who's been in leadership has experienced that. He said, they're just, I can't deal with their complaining anymore, it's too much for me. But by turning to God, God was able to strengthen Moses so he could continue to lead. So the answer is yes. So here's what I would pray for. I would pray that the, God would raise up people in Romania who will tell a better story who will cast a better vision, who will unite people out of where you can go and the potential there is, rather than the pain and the grievances that everybody has. And maybe, I don't know, maybe there were one or two in this room. You know, it's one thing to sit around and complain about how bad the politicians are, but in a democracy, the beautiful thing is, it's possible to run. I mean, how many do you need? A thousand people, two thousand people? How many do you need to get? I, I'm not sure what it is in Romania, what you need to get on to the ballot. Depends on the level. Depends on the level. But I would start. Find that person, get behind them. But maybe God's calling you to be that person. It, we need to be willing to try to make a difference. Otherwise, all the voices you have are the angry ones. I, I, I don't want to minimize how hard this is. I mean, this is, this is what we're talking about. is difficult. This is hard. But it's also worthwhile. There's a question that kind of touches the casting a better story, yeah. a better vision, um, and it goes like this. Sometimes the Christian narrative focuses on the sufferings of Christ. The emphasis on his suffering is a mean of persuasion for Christianity. What do you think? Hmm. When we talk of the Christian gospel, one of the briefest summaries of that is given to us in Corinthians. And there's a little part of Corinthians, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Are you familiar with that? And the amazing thing is, is that um, when this is quoted in scripture, it's quoted saying, you already know this is true. Okay? You all have already heard it taught to you. So when you look at the book of Galatians, when you look at parts of Corinthians, which are quite early books written about AD, somewhere between late AD 40, mid AD 50, so 15 to 20 years after Christ's death, the apostle Paul is able to write to Christians saying, as you have already heard, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. He's not claiming to teach them something, he's saying, you know this, okay? And the way it's written implies almost like it's a song. You know, they sing it. So that means it wasn't written a year before. Does that make sense? There's no, we don't have Spotify. There's no way for churches everywhere to find the same songs quickly. It takes years for them to spread. So he's appealing to a very early formulation. Now, why am I saying this? When we talk about the gospel, when we talk about the message of the cross, we're talking about life's, Christ's life, his death, his resurrection, is coming again. That is what we mean by the gospel. Does that make sense? That is what defines us. That is what gives us hope. And all of it is important. His life is important. How he lived, what he said and taught is important. His physical death on the cross is important. His resurrection is important. And he's coming again. So all of that we need to emphasize. So we do not under-emphasize the fact that he died. Does that make sense? That you can't minimize that. But we also have to see it in context, which is why we sing about the gospel. 
Um, we need to recover that hope. A, a few weeks ago, my wife and I were with a group of leaders. Uh, I, can't, I can't say too much about it. They were from some of the most persecuted countries in the world. We saw pictures of Christians being beheaded, burned alive, put in prison. Have you ever heard of the underground church? Well, we saw a picture of a tunnel about this wide that went down 15 feet, went underground into a cave they had made, five foot tall, no water. They said you could smell the toilet. People who were converted in that country go into that cave and it's too dangerous for them to come in and out. Locals will drop food for them and they will spend three months in that cave, no water, no washing, whatever food is brought to the top of the tunnel so they can memorize the Bible. After they've memorized it, they go out to tell people about Jesus. When they shared their stories, they all had two things in common. Several of them said, we are so down this road with Jesus, it would be crazy to go back. Does that make sense? We've lost everything. <laughs> Only an idiot would stop following Jesus now. They've taken our life, our liberty, our family, our money, our property. They're killing our friends. We are... We are so invested in this and in who Jesus is, we don't even think of going a different direction. We, you know, this is the only way. And the second thing was the amount of hope they had. They were so joyful. When they told their stories, they wept with tears. Literally, they would share their stories, they would get on their knees, we would gather around to pray for them. We did this for five days. The floor would be wet with their tears as they shared some of the pain they had been through. But at breakfast time, lunch time, when we went out for dinner, people looked at us like we were taking drugs. Why are they so loud? Why are they laughing so much? Who are all of these crazy people from these strange countries? So, so one of the things, and it's not the only thing, and this is a minor part, this is not the central message of the cross, it's just a minor part, it's important. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, what did he say? okay, God, this would be a good time to take out those who don't like me. When he cried out, what did the people think he was asking God for? Didn't they think he was asking for help to come? And yet Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. One of the things we see on the cross is Jesus has come to win a victory and he knows how much it will cost him and how hard it will be. But you don't see bitterness flowing from him from the cross. You're all crazy, you have no idea what you're doing. You hear him crying out to his father, may there be mercy for these people. That's an incredible response. So even when we think about his death on the cross, there's one other thing that helps us with this. It also gives us hope in a slightly different way. It means, you're suffering rejection, so did Jesus. You've been physically beaten and persecuted, well, so was Jesus. You've had your character destroyed and people tell rumors about you, well, so did Jesus. Here's a friend of tax collectors and sinners, he's a drunk. Whatever pain we experience in this world, we have a savior who understands it. And that, that, gives us, that gives us hope. I hope that makes, I hope that makes sense. It, what it means is that we may bear the scars of what has been done to us, but the scars don't have to hurt all the time. So even though we may bear the scars of what we've had to suffer, actually they don't have to hurt. We can, we can be released from that. It may take time, and it may take a lot of friends, but it's possible. I think if I'm understanding your correct, the question, have I answered it, or did I answer a different question? Don't answer that I question. Have one question. <laughs> <laughs> Don't answer um, that question. You touched on the fact that Cyprus yeah. has a victim culture because yeah. of the history. Yeah. Now, we can identify with that. Yeah. Um, either Russians, Turks, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Austrians, yeah. we don't name the other country. <laughs> um, not inclusion. Um, 
Yeah, there are two questions touching on the nation issue. Yeah. Um, can a person or a nation become numb from too much pain mm. wow. or too much pain narratives wow. when everything hurts, nothing really hurts? And oh. then the reverse question is, yeah. we have some smart people here, so yeah. really good questions. How can grievance culture be changed in a country or in a community? Oh, wow. It's true. You can be in so much pain, you don't know where it hurts anymore. I, I wish I had not had experience of this. I won't go into the detail of it. It's not appropriate in this setting, but, but um, when God taught me this lesson, I can remember thinking, it would have been nicer to learn this lesson going to Hawaii with a big set of books and God saying, read these books by these clever people very carefully. There are some lessons you need to learn. Well, the way we learned them was slightly more painful than that. Um, so you can, you can be in so much pain. When people ask you, how are you? You dread being asked the question. And as a country, it's possible to be in it and you can become numb to it. You can also become powerless in the face of it. So victim narratives tend to be disempowering. Does that make sense? Everything's done to you, this is what's happened to you and you feel disempowered, which is why in a victim narrative, you want an outside party to come and do what you can't do. The second part of the question helps answer that first part. If something terrible has happened to you, it's very important to understand, when we talk about victim narratives and cultures, I don't like that term because it creates the impression that the pain isn't real. That's not what any of this means. The pain and injustice can be very real. But what it means is this. Let's suppose you were in a horrible situation where you were abused as a child. Now, you're not to blame for that, although some people think they are to blame, but you're not to blame. So you are an innocent victim. Does that make sense? Someone did something to you which was terrible. Now, the question is, is it possible to live a life where that doesn't control your future anymore? So this is what Vulcan means by the idea of chosen trauma. If you relate to that historical event in a certain way, what that person did to you is terrible and they're making you pay every day you live all the way into your future. So not only have they broken your past, they're stealing your future too. So when you talk about moving out of that mindset, you're not denying the, just, the injustice. Does that make sense? You're not saying it didn't happen. You're not pretending it didn't happen. You're not saying it doesn't matter. What you're trying to do is put yourself in a place where you're saying, I don't want this to define me anymore. I'm a person. And I don't want this to control my future anymore. I don't want this to determine how I respond emotionally anymore. When I hear something difficult and it brings everything come back. I, I want to break that. I don't want this wrong to control my future. So, yes, in a nation there is a way to, to move beyond it. And the most powerful way is by trying to model something different. I, I mean, just on a personal note, when I, a few years ago, I was speaking in Northern Cyprus. So my family is from Cyprus. In 1974, my family lost all of their land, all of their property, all of their houses, everything. And so I was invited to speak in Northern Cyprus at a conference for people, leaders from 20, 30 different countries. And some of my family, and I, had, and I talked about it you know, with very close family, were, you cannot go and speak there. It, it is wrong. They've stolen our land, they've stolen our homes, they've stolen everything. It's wrong to go. And I prayed about it and um, decided that actually I would go and speak. Then someone asked me a question which I thought about and I hadn't anticipated how strongly I would feel. So there were maybe, I don't know, 3,000 people there, 4,000 people. And then someone asked the question, Michael, your mother is from Cyprus, you're in northern Cyprus. How do you feel about the people who are here? And I'm now sitting on a piece of land that used to belong to my family and there's a hotel on it. And I was surprised at my immediate, how deeply I felt that question. I, 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 and all of a sudden my mind went blank. Everything I'd thought about already, none of it seemed sure anymore. And I remember standing there and just 
praying for a moment and saying, Jesus, I need you to really help me with this one. So what I ended up saying was something like this. I want to feel about the people here the same way God feels about them. How does God feel about them? Well, when I was God's enemy and I hated him, he gave his life for me that I may be forgiven and come to know him. And the same peace and forgiveness I have come to know through Jesus, I would like everybody here to know as well. And there's a huge release in that. So it is possible, this is very difficult. Interestingly, when I went back and spoke with my mother's closest friend, who'd had a very long talk with me and she was not happy about going, when I shared with her what I had said, she smiled and she said, good. I'm glad you said that. I'm not even sure if she was a Christian or not. There, there has, we, it is so difficult to break these cycles. If we don't break them, the past will always control the future. These are very deep questions. Yeah, we will, don't you have a question about my favorite recipe? Do I, you know? Favorite Romanian. Romanian dish? Yes. And ah, I've had, now I've forgotten the name in Romanian. I've had the pig that you're thankful for. Pomana porcoli. Oh, Pomana, yes, that one. I was very thankful. It's <laughs> a funny translation. <laughs> We're thankful for every pig, so not, not just a specific dish. Um, there are quite a few questions on the same topic, yeah. how to change the narrative and so on. Yeah. I think you touched enough. Um, <clears throat> the last question that came on the list, and I find it very interesting, yeah. is a victim by complaining obtains attention, yes. love. How can we give them love without validating the oh. victimization? You're a very clever audience. Um, it's a very good question. I mean, there's a basic parenting thing here that any parent knows, and children learn it very early. The more naughty you are, the more attention you get. So you can encourage children inadvertently to act out. And that's difficult. So there are a couple of things. Sometimes you have to figure out when will you ignore something. Um, sometimes some of the people I meet in some parts of the world who've done terrible things to other people, sometimes terrible things to people I know and love and are my friends, they're talking justifying what they've done. And you immediately want to jump in and start an argument. But sometimes you have to learn to sit and listen and then try and ask a question. So I'll just give one example. Um, I have three children. They have such different characters, it's incredible. Um, one of our children, whenever you told them off, they were, one of our children, you told them off, they would burst into tears and they would feel the pain for a week. Okay? Uh, one would take it very seriously, they would be fine the next day. One would stand in front of you with chocolate on their face, chocolate on their hands, chocolate on their clothes, and say, I didn't eat the chocolate. And if you sent them to their room, go to your room, they would be very happy. They would go to their room, they would sing in their room for two, three hours, you'd come and talk to them later. Are you sorry? No. You know? And actually, they love being in their room on their own. So you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, <laughs> we need a different strategy. And I remember coming home or one day. Child. Yeah, to a different <laughs> child. Yeah. And I'm sure that at times they wanted different parents. Uh, so I remember coming home one day and Anne had had a difficult day and she says, you need to talk. And so I went upstairs and I, and I sat them down and I asked them a question. I just said, why, why didn't you tell the truth when you were asked? And they just looked at me. And then I said, do you like the way you made your mother feel? And they said, no. I said, well, do you like the way you feel now? And they said, no. I said, how, how do you think you could make this better? And they were maybe five years old at the time. And they said, I should say sorry. I said, yeah, I think, I think that will help. And we had to just think of a different way. Now, that's just at a... At a 
parental level. Put it now onto a national level. How do you bring about reconciliation at a national level? It is possible. And I'll give you two strange historical examples. Number one, Americans should hate British people. If you think about it, they were a colonial power. Does that make sense? The Americans fought a revolution against them. They got rid of the British people. They didn't like them. They took the tea, they put it in the water. I mean, lots of bad things happened. So, historically, you would expect there should be animosity between the two, right? Because of that kind of relationship. And yet, for the last 150 years, and maybe it's weakening a bit now, but people talked of the special relationship between North America and the UK, how close friends they were. Why? I have to believe that the fact that America went through a great awakening and England went through a great revival in terms of the Christian faith, that that had something to do with about how those two groups of people actually came to be friends rather than enemies. There's another interesting one, the relationship between Israel and Germany. You would expect that to be a very difficult relationship, but actually it's not. I mean, maybe for some people it is, but actually on a state level, and that's because several things happened. There was a recognition of pain that had been caused. There was an acknowledgement of what had been done wrong. And then there was a concerted effort to find a way to, to come together. So it's not that this world is without historical example, and none of them are perfect. It doesn't mean that every American loves every British person and every British person loves every American person. That wouldn't be true. And that's not true between Germany and Israel. But in terms of the relationships as states, it is true. So it is possible, but it always comes at great cost and it comes with great leadership. You need a particular type of leader who's able, who's able to do that. And these people do, these people do exist. Um, yeah. So you mean that when two enemy countries get to the point of seeing together what a friend we have in Jesus. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I would, it amazes me that there aren't more people writing PhDs on what happened between the UK-US relation in particular. So I keep hoping that whenever I give this illustration, people will go and say, I'm going to do a PhD on this. I have a friend who was speaking in a church and he said, he said, every snowflake is different. And then he said, how do they know that? I mean, has someone gone and like looked at every snowflake? And, and then at the end of him speaking in church, he was in Oxford, a member of the church came and said, I did my PhD in snowflakes and everyone is different. I can explain to you why. So I, I'm living in hope one day I'll give this illustration. So actually, I did my PhD on this. I, I can tell you what happened. I'm waiting for that moment. One last question, which is on a slightly different note. Um, and it has to do with the places you go to travel. Yeah. Uh, do terrorists you spoke to even want to do the things they end up doing? Do you, have you succeeded in changing a terrorist's mind? Wow. Um, I'm not sure I have. Uh, I think God has um, several times. Um, I'll give one example. Um, I was once um, speaking in a room to about 50 men and women, um, about 15 men, 35 women. Um, they had successfully done a large bombing campaign in the West a little while earlier. And I was going to the country where they're based and someone said, would you like to meet with them? And they said, we can send four men with machine guns to protect you. And I said, if you're speaking to a room full of suicide bombers, four men with guns won't help. Hey? You just pull a cord, boom. You know, I said, I think we, we shouldn't do that. I said, I'll go. We took one armed guard who, when we were on the inside, they stayed outside with the car so that no one could put a device in the vehicle. But when we went in, we went in uh, with nothing. My question was, the question they asked me was why did Jesus have to die for us to be forgiven? That was the question. Which is a, a really good question. 
And very briefly, the way I tried to answer that question was the reason this question is so hard is mercy comes at the expense of justice by definition. And this is why when we have grievances, we find it hard to forgive. If we forgive, we extend mercy, but where's the justice? So by definition, mercy happens when justice is passed over. I said, and this makes forgiveness even difficult for God. It means if God does forgive us, well, if you do something wrong and you're punished, that's justice. If you do something wrong and you're forgiven, that's mercy. But if you were the person who was wronged and the person who wronged you is forgiven, you're left going, where's the justice? But the message of the cross is that not that God forgave us at the expense of his justice. The message is God forgave us through his justice. It's at the cross where Jesus becomes one with our sin and he pays the price for what we have done wrong. He bears the penalty. He takes on the consequence for our sin. He pays for it. He fulfills that requirement. He, he pays the price. He extends mercy through his justice, not at the expense of it. it. It took me 45 minutes to say that in that setting. And the leader at the back of the room stood up and yelled and said in a loud voice, it's very different for us. If you respect us, we may respect you. If you do not respect us, we will kill you. And I said, it, it is different in the gospel because Jesus came here to save sinners and to forgive. Then everyone, he started to move forward and everyone in the room stood up. And so it was very difficult to, to move. Um, so I began to walk to him. And as I walked to him, I had to squeeze my way through the people because it was a very small room. And as I was walking out, uh, a woman who was there came and said to me in perfect English, what you have shared is the only hope for our country. And she dropped a little ball of paper in my hand, a very tiny piece of paper rolled up that had her cell phone number on it. By the time I got to the back of the room, I had 13 little pieces of paper in my hand. And I thanked the guy for allowing me to come. And I gave these 13 pieces of paper to the man who was translating me. And then they would go to the toilet and he would ring them on their cell phone and do Bible studies with them and pray them to disciple them for the next three months. And they become excellent church planters. And when they join these terrorist organizations, they don't do it for an easy life. They're willing to lay down their life. Now, instead of blowing themselves up to kill someone, now they're willing to lay down their lives to serve someone. So the answer to your question is, is, is yes. Not, not, not everybody. I remember once speaking to a leader and when I talked about forgiveness with him and why Jesus came, he said, if this is true, it will change the world. That was his response. I said, I think it is true, and it's changed many people's worlds and hearts. Uh, but I have no idea what happened. Um, he was killed a few months later, and so I don't know what the outcome of that was. I mean, I would like to think that at some point in the next few months he met Jesus, but maybe he didn't, I don't know. But. The key thing is you have to be willing to go and you have to be willing to, to try. Um, and many of these people are surprised to see me because they think I wouldn't be willing to come. The very fact I'm willing to go and meet with them is enough for them to say, okay, we will, we will listen to you. And so you just have to learn how to speak respectfully and clearly to, to share what you have to say and then allow it with them to see what will happen. And actually, God sometimes does so much more than we imagine. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'd like to leave just one little story for you to think about. Everywhere I go, someone arranges for me to go there. So sometimes it's a student, sometimes it's a business person, sometimes it's a politician. They will say, I will gather these people together, you, you come and talk to them. They're taking a big risk. Because if it goes wrong, it, all kinds of things could happen. Now in Romania, you're unlikely to get shot, but you know, I mean, still, I mean, things could happen. Have you ever wondered what God would like to be doing with you if you were more willing to step out with him? 
That's an interesting question. Maybe, maybe he has more for you than where you currently are. Maybe he would like you to be more involved. Maybe there are more doors to be opened. Maybe more conversations to be had. Maybe he wants you to use you to, to say more and do more than you're doing at the minute. I can promise you one thing, it will not be boring. It may be difficult, it may be hard, it may be challenging, it may be amazing, it will not be boring. Thanks, Is that Michael. enough? It's great. Um, it was a pleasure for you to be here. It was a pleasure um, for me to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we thank you, and um, I assume if people have other questions, they could spend some time with you. Again. Absolutely. Um, mulțumim pentru atenție. Pentru cei care nu sunteți foarte familiar cu locul ăsta, duminica aici se întâlnește biserică, se numește Biserica Via. Sunteți bineveniți în um, fiecare duminică și încheiem seara asta aici și vă mulțumim pentru atenție. Thank you. Thank you.